Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Yamiche Alcindor in Washington. We begin in New York, where after 21 days in court and more than 80 hours of testimony, the fate of Donald Trump will soon be in the hands of 12 jurors. Right now, court is on a short break. The prosecution is in the middle of its closing argument in the former president's hush money trial. The district attorney's office hopes to convince the jury that Donald Trump tried to influence the 2016 election by hiding hush money payments to adult film star Stormy Daniels. So far in his closing argument, prosecutor Joshua Steinglass acknowledged Michael Cohen's credibility issues. He told jurors, quote, we didn't pick him up at the witness store, but Steinglass is imploring the jury to remember that this case is about Donald Trump and not Michael Cohen. Steinglass also conceded that some of Stormy Daniels' testimony was, quote, cringeworthy, but that the story of her alleged affair was the motive outlined in this case. That comes in response to Donald Trump's attorney, Todd Blanche, who has delivered his closing arguments, speaking for nearly three hours earlier today. Blanche presented jurors with what he said were 10 reasons why they should have reasonable doubt in the case, telling jurors that the prosecution did not meet its burden of proof. He also said that there was, quote, not a shred of evidence Trump intended to cover up the hush money payments. Blanche focused much of his attention on the prosecution's two star witnesses, Stormy Daniels, whom he accused of trying to extort Trump, and Michael Cohen, depicting him as vindictive and untrustworthy. Blanche played audio of Cohen screaming during one of his podcasts, calling him the MVP of liars and the gloat, greatest liar of all time. Outside the courthouse, Donald Trump's adult sons and daughter-in-law spoke to the press, with Don Jr. echoing many of Trump attorneys' attacks on Cohen's credibility. I think Todd Blanche summed it up best. If there was an MVP, if there was a goat of liars, it is Michael Cohen. Michael Cohen is the embodiment of reasonable doubt. And this entire case hinges on someone who has quite literally lied to every single person and body he's ever been in front of. He's lied before, I believe it's every branch of Congress. He's lied before his wife. He's lied to bankers. He's lied to all of you in the press. And he's actually lied to that very jury. And yet, he's the only person of relevance that this entire case hinges on. The prosecution is expected to finish summations this evening. We expect the jury will get their instructions tomorrow morning. And then deliberations will begin on those 34 felony counts of falsifying business records. Joining me now outside the Manhattan courthouse is NBC News' Yasmin Basugan. Also with me, our panel of legal experts, Chuck Rosenberg, former U.S. attorney and senior FBI official, and now an NBC News legal analyst. Danny Savalos, a criminal defense attorney and also an NBC News legal analyst, and trial attorney Misty Maris. Thank you all for being here. So, Yasmin, you're there. You've been covering this trial for a long time now. The prosecution's arguments are underway. What have we heard from Joshua Steinglass so far? <laughs> Feels like a real long time this afternoon, I got to say, listening to these um, closing arguments, two hours and 45 minutes or so for Todd Blanche's closing arguments in the defense. Uh, we are about an hour and 45 minutes into um, Joshua Steinglass's um, closing arguments for the prosecution, and he says he's only a third of the way through. Um, so that means we got about uh, three hours or three hours and 15 minutes or so left of this um, closing argument from Joshua Steinglass, wondering, of course, if, if the judge is going to ask the jury to stay even later than the jury has already agreed to, re to remain in place. Um, there's a bench meeting happening right now, Yamish, um, inside the courtroom. So we're going to get uh, a decision on that soon. Marshawn is actually, and that's why I keep looking down, by the way, um, at my iPad. Marshawn is talking about how the schedule may go for um, the rest of the day. So they're taking a break today around 5 p.m., and they're going to pick up around um, 5.30 p.m. or so, and they're going to see how everybody is doing at that point. So that means we have about an hour left. They'll take a 30-minute longer break. Usually these breaks last around 15 minutes, and then they'll resume. So it seems as if we're going to stay in place uh, until Steinglass has completed his closing arguments for uh, the prosecution. We're in it for a long night. Let me just briefly walk you through what we've heard some, from Steinglass so far. And he's trying to kind of clean up some of the holes in which Todd Blanche has poked in the prosecution's arguments here in their case. One of which was this October 24th phone call, right? It was this really big moment for the defense in which um, a phone call was made by Michael Cohen um, to, to Keith Schiller, Donald Trump's body man. And in this phone call, essentially, uh, Michael Cohen alleges that he talked to Donald Trump about releasing the money to Stormy Daniels. He paid Stormy Daniels subsequently two days later, $130,000.
Todd Blanche pushed back on this in his cross-examination of Michael Cohen. It was a real gotcha moment for Michael Cohen, um, for Todd Blanche, I, su I should say, in that he said, how could you basically have this conversation in 90 seconds because you were texting about someone harassing you, and then you text messaged that phone number of the individual that was harassing you to Keith Shuler. And the redirect, the prosecution came back and said, well, here's a picture of Keith Schiller and Donald Trump. They were on the stage together at this campaign rally. They were there together. This conversation may very well have happened. Well, in this closing argument from Joshua Steinglass of this 90-second phone call, he essentially said, let me take you through how much you can actually talk about in just 90 seconds' time. In fact, we've had conversations. We've had testimony of transcripts of conversations between Michael Cohen and Donald Trump that lasted 46 sec 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 seconds in which they covered all of these various topics. And so he tried to poke a major hole in this gotcha moment um, that Todd Blanche felt like he had achieved in that cross-examination of Michael Cohen that he, by the way, brought up again in his um, closing arguments. He also talked about Michael Cohen, right? I believe two hours of Todd Blanche's closing arguments was spent talking about Michael Cohen and his lack of credibility and how he is a repeated liar. Well, um, Steinglass basically said, look, we didn't choose Michael Cohen. We, we didn't take him, I believe he said, and I'm paraphrasing here from a you know, lottery of, of, of witnesses. This is who we were, we were being given. And he called Michael Cohen Donald Trump's conciliary, uh, referring kind of to the phrase used um, in, in the mafia business. Um, he said, if Michael Cohen was lying about all this, yes, he's lied in the past, but wouldn't he kind of make up a story that has even more corroboration than we have already seen? And so they're trying to poke holes in some of the arguments already being made by Todd Blanche. And I suspect as we return from this break and as he tries to kind of wrap up over the, by the way, the next three hours or so of his closing arguments, he's going to get Yamish into those documents, into the documents that really create and make the case for the prosecution. Um, and as you just pointed out, you know, Todd Blanche, he, he went after Michael Cohen over and over again, calling him a liar multiple times. What do you think are the key points there? You talked about the prosecution yeah. pushing back on there, but what were the key points that Todd, Todd Blanche was trying to get across there? All he has to do is, all the jury has to walk away with this reasonable doubt, right? And Todd Blanche kind of wrapped up, and I think in, in a pretty kind of smart way, his his closing arguments. But I'm, of course, not an attorney. You've got attorneys on the panel to, to kind of um, assess that. The 10 ways in which he believes that there could be reasonable doubt, right? He went through this list of 10 ways in which he believed there was, there was reasonable doubt that the jury could take away from, which I thought was interesting way of, of doing things, right? Because it's kind of like this headline moment that the jury can take from as they go into del deliberations likely um, tomorrow. But he really spent the majority of time, and it's not something that, that um, we were surprised by, in chipping away at Michael Cohen's credibility, as he has, by the way, through this entire trial. I mean, it's not a joke when we say, despite the fact that Donald Trump is the defendant in this case, Michael Cohen is as, as well, it seems, with the way that Todd Blanche is presenting um, this event. Also, chipping away at Stormy Daniels' uh, credibility and how she has, and we've heard this before from Todd Blanche, how she has an ax to grind, how this was extortion. But then Steinglass, in his closing arguments, has already addressed that and said extortion, by the way, is not a defense. Whether or not she wanted money or not is not really the question. Yes, she wanted money, but that does not, is not a proper defense for falsifying documents to, to uh, influence uh, an election. Well, yes, I mean, I mean, you've, again, been out there all the time for us, so thank you so much for breaking all that down. And Chuck, I want to come to you. The prosecutors here, they face the burden of proof. They get the last word per New York law. Based on what you're hearing so far, are they effectively making their case, Chuck? Well, look, I think both sides are doing more or less what I expected they would do. Uh, Yamish, the defense argument was, you know, poking at Michael Cohn, who is, by the way, a liar and a thief and a creep. Um, not surprising that they would take a shot or two or three at him. Um, and they also, you know, reminded the jury of the significant burden that the government has, proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And they argued that there was no real good evidence, no evidence at all of intentionality by Mr. Trump. Exactly what you'd expect. So what do you expect from the government here? And are they making their case? They are taking the narrative that they promised an opening statement um, and which they adduced through many scores of documents and 20 witnesses and explaining the narrative in detail to the jury. It's exactly
exactly what I would expect them to do. Um, in fact, I think, you know, ask Danny as a, as a very uh, good and experienced defense lawyer who will tell you that the argument that, you know, we take the witnesses as we find them. We didn't get them at the witness store. We don't, you know, we'd love if all of our witnesses were nuns and librarians, but, you know, Mr. Trump picked Mr. Cohn as a witness, and that's why we had to put him on the stand. That's standard prosecutorial fare. So you're seeing standard defense fare, and you're seeing standard prosecutorial fare. No surprises here, I think, Yamish. Well, Chuck, to, to stick with you, to get a felony charge, prosecutors need to prove the payments were concealed in furtherance of another crime. Have they done that? Well, so two questions, right, really bound up in your one very good question. Did they adduce enough evidence? Did they introduce enough evidence at trial uh, to make that case? Yes, absolutely. Will the jury credit it? That's a more difficult question. That requires a prediction I'm not capable of making. Um, but there was sufficient evidence at trial, both circumstantial and direct, of those elements. And by the way, Yamish, if you believe Michael Cohen, if the jury finds him credible, then that's the proof. Um, we will know whether or not the jury finds Cohen and the rest of the government's case credible you know, in a few days or so. Um, but was there sufficient evidence to support a conviction I think there was. Mm. And Misty, I want to come to you. Joshua Steinglass, he called Stormy Daniels' story messy, cringeworthy, as we noted. But I wonder, what do you make of the fact that he said very clearly she was the motive, she is the motive in this case. Do you think he made that argument? He's making that argument because it gives the prosecution a narrative, and juries like to hear the story. And so talking about Stormy Daniels' story being cringeworthy, hearing some information that maybe we all would have rather not heard, that is Trump's motive to suppress this story. It is the reason why he did not want this story coming out in advance of the election. So that point was made by prosecutors to make this a very digestible and very relatable set of circumstances that the jury can look at in this case and say, well, Stormy Daniels' story did have all of these cringeworthy aspects. No wonder Donald Trump did not want this to come out, especially in the wake of the Access Hollywood tape. So it's really putting together all of the pieces. And now what we're seeing from prosecutors is all of what we heard being put into a timeline. So they talked about the credibility of witnesses, and now they're going timeline into the actual facts of the case and applying what they've already told the jury. So that was an effective way of telling a narrative. Mm. And Danny, Joshua Steinglass here, he argued that the jury doesn't have to believe Michael Cohen to find a conspiracy. That's after Todd Blanche repeatedly attacked Michael Cohen's credibility. Just here's, here's some of what he just said. Uh, and this, of course, is, is Todd Blanche talking about Michael Cohen. He said, you should want and expect more than the testimony of Michael Cohen. Cohen lied to you. He's literally the MVP of liars. Michael Cohen is the gloat. He's literally the greatest liar of all time. Was that an effective strategy by Todd Blanche to continue to talk about Michael Cohen, to make that's such a, a key part of his argument and forcing the prosecution to relitigate his, his credibility? It's effective only in the sense that it is the exact same argument that defense attorneys have used with cooperating witness types like Michael Cohen for centuries. I mean, that is the that is the game. The game is the prosecution uses a cooperating witness who has dubious credibility. And the reason for that is that it's usually another criminal who's doing criminal things with the criminal defendant. And then the defense rails against this particular witness, calls him a liar over and over again. And then the prosecution says, well, the reason this witness isn't perfect is that he's the witness who did bad things with the defendant. This has been going on for literally hundreds of years. I'm not kidding. Uh, and it cooperating witnesses like Michael Cohen are used because they work. And so the defense can make some headway by pointing out that the cooperating witness type is a liar, has a motive to lie. Uh, and in fact, Michael Cohen is kind of a little different than other cooperating witnesses in the sense that there isn't a traditional plea agreement that you can exploit as a defense attorney and say, you're lying here to give the prosecution what they want so they give you what you want, which is a sentence reduction. That's not really present here. But in all other aspects, this is what happens all the time Anytime the, the prosecution uses someone who has uh, some questionable credibility, it's no surprise. None of the arguments about Cohen are a surprise, either from the defense 
or from the prosecution. What the defense is hoping they can do is get the jury to say, you know, Michael Cohen is such an awful witness, we're going to disregard everything. But the prosecution is correctly pointing out that Michael Cohen's t testimony is supported by corroborating evidence, things like documents that don't lie. Well, Chuck, it's interesting, as, as you and Danny have both pointed out, and Missy has pointed out, that this is sort of standard um, for, for people who are used to watching prosecutions and defenses make their case before juries. But the prosecution here is also arguing that the same qualities the defense is really urging are bad, the same ones that they're saying are make Michael Cohen not credible. They're the same qualities that made former President Trump choose him as his fixer. What's your, what's your reaction to that? Can the prosecution really both say, yeah, he might have credibility issues, but also we're here because Donald Trump put him here. Well, that's exactly right. He does have credibility issues. I mean, he's a convicted felon. He's a convicted perjurer. Um, not the guy you would want, you know, holding your backdoor key if you were away for a couple of weeks. All that said, Yamish, um, this, as Danny explained, happens all the time, all the time in courts around the United States every day. Who is around when crimes are committed? And the answer is criminals. In this case, one alleged criminal, Mr. Trump, is on trial, and another convicted criminal, Michael Cohen, is testifying at the trial. So can the government say both that, uh, that Michael Cohen has credibility problems, but he's telling the truth here and you ought to believe him? Absolutely. That's exactly what they've done. And by the way, the reason, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that you can believe him is because he's corroborated by 19 other witnesses and scores of documents. And also, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, by the way, use your common sense. Understand what happened here. Look holistically at the whole story. Mr. Trump had sex with an adult film actress. She was going to tell the story right before the election. He wanted to kill that story. And they created a scheme with Michael Cohn as an essential part of it to do exactly that. Mm. And Danny, we've been talking a lot about Michael Cohen, but there was also a big part of Dodd Blanche's argument to the jury, and that was really playing down the Access Hollywood tape and the impact it would have, saying that Donald Trump, um, to Donald Trump, it wasn't a doomsday event. Was Todd Blanche maybe too dismissive of the impact of the Hollywood Access tape, given what's on that tape? Part of the job of defense counsel, especially in closing, is to be dismissive of all aspects of the prosecution's case. There's so many elements that a defense will look at and just say, ah, that's no big deal. They have to, because that's the defense's role. The defense isn't building anything. The defense is just chipping away. They're pot shotting. And in a way, this format in New York, in state court, where the defense goes first, uh, is more challenging because you are in advance pot shotting at what you don't know yet is coming, but you're sure is going to be coming up in the prosecution's closing. In federal court, for example, the prosecution goes first and last. So you, as the defendant, at least get a preview and can react to what they're arguing. But look, that's what you do as a defense attorney is you minimize the evidence of the prosecution because often the only evidence in the case is the prosecution's evidence. Often the defense introduces zero evidence, zero testimony. So that is your role, to look at the evidence and say, that's all you got? That's not a big deal. And sometimes, you know, look, as a defense attorney, you lose some objectivity. So does the prosecution because you are living in these facts. And sometimes that argument may sound very hollow to an objective jury or an outside observer. Uh, but as a defense attorney, you're living in it. And after a while, you start thinking all of the case is lousy, just as the prosecution in their minds are thinking we have a killer case here. Well, Missy, I want to ask you something else about the, the arguments that Todd Blanchard are making, and that is that he was asking the jury to believe David Pecker um, but not believe Michael Cohen. Is that a mistake? It becomes difficult because the whole aspect of this case is that it is a conspiracy. So it's a meeting of the minds to in falsify business records in order to cover up these illegal campaign contributions. So saying one is not credible, but the other is credible could always be uh, something that's problematic. However, now there's been such a strong focus by the prosecution on the October 2015 meeting where the three come together and talk about catching and killing stories, amplifying stories stories that uh, are negative for Trump's uh, other other uh, politicians in his sphere, amplifying those stories and catching and killing stories that are negative for him. And the prosecution.
Constitution is saying you have to look at every fact through this prism. So if the jury does buy that, then that would be the way to establish that intent and not have to be so reliant on Michael Cohen. Mm. Um, and, and talking about Michael Cohen, Chuck, I want to give you the last thought here. The prosecution says that they still have hours to go in their closing, in their closing argument. Um, could there be an issue here for jurors? Oh, I think so. But look, Yamish, my opinion on this is sort of a product of my bias. I practiced as a federal prosecutor in the Eastern District of Virginia. A lot of folks know it as the rocket docket. I might have begged in a case like this for 30 minutes to close and be given 20. Um, and so I do think there's a law of diminishing marginal returns. Um, again, a lot of that is based on my own experience. Uh, but, you know, the jurors have sat through weeks of trial. Um, almost two dozen witnesses, you know, as I said, scores, if not hundreds of documents, they get it. Make the points you have to make, sit down and be quiet. A, a clear message from Chuck Rosenberg here. Thank you, Rosenberg, Rosenberg, Rosenberg here. Thank you so much um, to Chuck, to Danny, to Misty. I appreciate all of you. And we'll be keeping a close eye on the courthouse and we'll bring you any new developments as we get them. Coming up, another legal update tied to former President Donald Trump. The judge in his classified documents trial rejects the government's request for a gag order following Trump's false and outrageous claim that the FBI's search of his residence was part of a secret assassination plot. But first, the Biden campaign tries to capitalize on the Trump trial media frenzy with a press conference at the courthouse and how the verdict in the hush money trial may or may not shake up the 2024 race. The panel's next. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back. We're continuing to keep an eye on the legal developments inside the courtroom where the prosecution is delivering its closing arguments in former President Trump's criminal hush money trial. But we now turn to the political developments. And today, for the first time since this trial began, the Biden campaign held a press conference outside the lower Manhattan courtroom. Michael Fanone and Harry Dunn, two law enforcement officials who were attacked during the January 6th riot at the Capitol, and actor Robert De Niro spoke for the Biden campaign. This is the time to stop him by voting him out once and for all. We don't want to wake up after the election saying, what, again? My God, what the hell have we done? We can't have that happen again. Donald Trump is the greatest threat to our democracy and the safety of communities across the country today. He has encouraged and continue to encourage political violence. Hey, this election is about Donald Trump and his vision for the office of the president of the United States. Not as a public servant, who answers to the elected, to the people who elected him, but is an authoritarian who answers to and serves only himself. The Biden campaign press conference comes in the wake of NBC News reporting that the Biden campaign was considering a change in strategy and a more gr aggressive posture after the trial. The Trump campaign responded to the Biden press conference, calling it a sign of desperation. Joining me now on set is Deepa Shivaram. She's a White House correspondent for NPR. Susan Page, Washington Bureau Chief for USA Today. Maria Teresa Kramar, President and CEO of Voto Latino and an NBC News contributor and Republican strategist Lance Tover. So thank you all for being here. Deepa, I want to start with you. It was a really interesting scene to see the Biden campaign try to come and capitalize on this trial coverage. What's their logic here since they've they stayed away from this for so long? Yeah, they had stayed away from it so long. And then we see Robert De Niro outside the courthouse the, special guest. <laughs> the first time that they're kind of weighing in on this. I think it was really interesting because they didn't just comment on the fact that Trump has been, you know, in the middle of this trial. This wasn't really about Trump. They really tried to make that hard pivot to this is about democracy, right? Bringing in these officers from January 6th, making that the focus of their kind of counterpoint to all of this, because we know that that is something that voters, specifically Democratic voters, do have a lot of concerns about. So they're trying to draw attention to their own issues by staging this kind of press conference outside the courthouse. But it was really notable because we they haven't really weighed in uh, this far, as you said. And I was talking to the Biden campaign today and an official there told me th that they really wanted to make sure that they capitalized sort of on the coverage of, of this, that they wanted to make this case. But do you think they really got out of it what they wanted, given that they, they came with these politically overt 
sort of figures, even though, you know, they're actors, they're law enforcement, but they also are people who have been very outwardly talking in the Democratic Party. It's hard to say. I mean, I think we'll have to see how much that kind of holds traction with folks as this goes forward. I think a lot of voters I speak to are certainly not super clued into this trial day in and day out. It's not something that they're very much paying attention to. Uh, but I will say, like I said before, that argument about democracy, threats to democracy, bringing up January 6th, I think as folks tune in more to the election as the months go on, we're about five months out now. That is something that people really stop and do remember. Oh, do you remember, you know, what it felt like on January 6th, what it looked like on January 6th? Yeah. Reminding folks of that is something that when I speak to voters out on the road, like they really do remember that. And I cover Nevada a lot. We were talking about this outside. I remember talking to a lot of voters there, even back in 2022, saying I'm voting Democrat for the first time because I'm concerned about a peaceful transfer of power. So mm -hmm. that's very top of mind for a lot of voters I speak to. Susan, what did you make of this decision by the Trump, by the Biden campaign? I think they're very concerned about what they're calling Trump amnesia. Mm -hmm. And that is the idea that Americans who were distressed by elements of, of Trump's presidency have kind of forgotten the things they didn't like and remembered the things they did not like. You know, I'm thinking even of the USA Today Suffolk University poll. In our last poll, we asked, did you approve of the job Donald Trump did as president? And he got a higher approval rating than he ever got during his actual presidency. So I think mm. they're trying to remind people, think hard about this before you remember it in the kind of a soft focus, what Donald Trump's presidency was like for you. I mean, I mean, what do you make of the timing of this? They could have waited a couple days later when we will likely probably have a verdict, though, though we don't know how long it's going to take the jury to deliberate, but they wanted to do it now. I think part of it, folks are concerned with the verdict. And this allows you to talk about the importance of democracy going into an election, because let's not forget the reason that there was no red wave in large part was, yes, abortion was on the ballot, but also you had everybody tuning in over the summer about when they were talking about the January 6th committee hearings, and that reminded people where the ballot was. So I think we're going to see a little bit more of that. We're going to see people reminding the anxiety that people felt when they woke up in the morning. And this is the challenge that the campaign has right now, is that the economy is revving for many but there's also a lot of folks with the gig economy, second jobs, where the economy is not delivering in places like Nevada and Arizona. And so for them, they're under the impression that maybe it was better under Trump. And so they're going to see, what, I th what I'm going to see, uh, what I'm looking for is that you're going to see them a reminder that democracy is on the ballot. We're working along the economy. But at the end of the day, how, who made you feel safer when you went to bed at night? Mm. And Lance, I'm going to play some sound from you because right after Robert De Niro and these law enforcement officials walked away from those mics, the Trump campaign came right up. Take a listen to what they said. After months of saying the politics had nothing to do with this trial, they showed up and made a campaign event out of a lower Manhattan trial day for President Trump. This is all politics. If you don't think this is politics, then why do the Democrats wheel out a retread like Robert De Niro to try to change the subject? Now, the Biden campaign told me we knew that they were going to attack us for being overly political, being a witch hunt. Um, we, we made the consideration that, that we still want to come out today and do this. But it was a risk that they took because now you could have someone like Jason Miller come out and say, this is all connected. What do you make of this, Lance? I've talked to a number of Republican strategists today, political type people, and they're all scratching their heads saying, what were the Biden people thinking? Donald Trump has been very effective for the last few weeks saying this is a politically charged trial. It is a Biden trial. It is run by the Democrats. And what do they do? They step out in front of the microphones and the cameras today and make it a political trial. I think they ran right into exactly what the Trump people wanted to do today. Mm. Maria, what do you make of that? Maria Chair, so what do you make of that? I, I, I go back to my original statement. I actually think people are concerned with what this trial is going to be. Is it going to, is he going to get any charges? Is it going to be a hung jury? And so they're trying to make a lot of his felony counts through the media. Mm. And it's who is actually talking. And it's, yes, you have Robert De Niro, but more importantly, you have the two officers that suffered under January, uh, the September, um, the January 6th uh, riot. And I think that is what makes them much more important to the American public right now. Yeah. And Susan, I want to read from you part of a piece in the New York Times today. It says, for a time, it seemed Biden thought the Trump's clinching of the Republican nomination, which he did in March, would cause voters to focus on the former president. Then the hope appeared to be that Trump's having to show up in the New York City courtroom and the resulting media frenzy would bring his op opponent to the front of voters' minds. Neither really did the trick. Now the Biden campaign is trying to take matters into their own hands. Um, do you think this trial went the way that the Biden campaign thought it would go? I think not. Uh, you know, and, and this is the story of the last nine years since since Trump emerged as a political figure that uh, things happen that, that his opponents assume 
are going to be very damaging, and then they prove either not to be, or they even prove to be helpful, as his indictments were during the Republican uh, during the Republican primaries. So I think there is some surprise among among. Democrats and among the Biden campaign, that there's not more reaction to some of the disclosures uh, of the trial and the kind of narrative arc we heard today in the in the closing arguments, the fact that so many Americans now believe there is a political motive behind this trial or it's not fair uh, for Donald Trump. Uh, and, and we'll see what the verdict is. I mean, a, a verdict, an acquittal would be a mm -hmm. huge victory for Donald Trump. Uh, a hung jury, maybe it's also okay. a victory for Donald Trump. The question is, if he's convicted, what is the effect of that? I mean, Deepa, from your reporting, what could be the effect of that? Because it seems the Biden campaign wants to change the trajectory of this race in this campaign. The president had the campaign trail to himself for a long time now. Um, but the verdict, one way or the other, will it make that much of a difference, especially especially if, it, if he's found um, not guilty? I think that's going to be, that will be interesting to watch. If he is found not guilty, you know, then we're going to hear the rhetoric from Republicans. This is a witch hunt. This is, you know, all politics and politically motivated. Um, but you might see more, you know, reaction of Donald Trump. He'll be back uh, on the trail. You'll see more of him. And honestly, that's what the Biden campaign kind of wants. Like, they want Americans to turn on their televisions and pay attention a little bit to what Donald Trump is saying at these rallies, at these events. And so in some ways, you know, it, it would complicate things. But I think for a lot of reasons, uh, there are folks on the Biden side who are hoping that Americans are paying attention to what Donald Trump is saying a little bit more. So it might kind of work both ways. Yeah. And Lance, guilty or not guilty, is this going to impact the Trump campaign? Well, I, it, the Trump campaign's been fighting a two-front battle right now, and as somebody who's been on a presidential can tell you fighting one battle alone is, is pretty difficult, so fighting two. They've done a really effective job at messaging. I would argue that the verdict, the public opinion verdict is pretty much in on this thing. I mean, they, the, I, they don't really care too much about it, or if they do care, they're showing they're su still supporting Donald Trump over the course of these last several weeks, so I would argue that the verdict is, is in with the public opinion right now. I mean, I wonder if a I conviction heard, yeah. is different. I think oh, in that everything 12 is, yeah. jurors and this has been a mm -hmm. serious trial. The yep. judge has gotten a lot of praise for the way in which he's run it. The jury seems to be paying close attention. If all 12 jurors agree on a conviction, maybe that has an effect, not with the core Trump supporters, right. but with some of the swing voters that will determine this election. And they've indicated that. They've indicated a lot of the voters saying, well, I will vote for Trump except if he has a conviction, because then all of a sudden it is coming out of the political space and back into that of of jurisdiction, uh, making sure that at the end of the day, it was done lawfully of what they decided. So yeah. That's right. Well, thank you so much, Diva, to Susan, to Maria Tessa, and to Lance. <laughs> a lot to talk about, and we'll have a lot more to talk about, I'm sure, in the coming days. And up next, Israeli tanks push deeper into southern Gaza despite global criticism and growing fallout from that deadly airstrike on an area where displaced Palestinians were sheltering in tents. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. We're following new reactions and new fallout after the deadly strike on a tent camp in Rafah. President Biden is facing increased pressure to try to rein in Israel's military campaign. Today, Vice President Kamala Harris addressed the strike, saying, quote, the word tragic doesn't even begin to describe it. And during today's White House briefing, National Security Communications Advisor John Kirby called the images coming out of Rafah devastating and once again urged Israel to do more to protect civilian lives. Despite that, the White House continues to face questions about whether this latest strike violates the president's red line. How does this not violate the red line that the president laid out? As I said, we don't want to see a major ground operation. We haven't seen that at this point. We don't support we won't support a major ground operation in Rafah. Uh, and we've, again, been very consistent on that. And the president said uh, that should that occur, then it might make him have to make different decisions in terms of support. We haven't seen that happen at this point. The U.N. now estimates more than a million people have fled Rafah in the last three weeks alone, and they have nowhere safe to go. Meanwhile, NBC News crew inside Gaza reports Israeli takes have reached Rafah's city center, despite the U.N. high court's order to immediately halt military operations and the Biden administration's fierce opposition to a major offensive there. NBC News international correspondent Ralph Sanchez has more from Tel Aviv. Hey there, an NBC News crew inside of Gaza confirms that Israeli tanks have now pushed into the very heart of Rafah. 
That's an indication Israel has no intention of slowing down its military offensive just days after that deadly and disastrous strike on a camp for displaced people, which killed at least 45. That's according to the emergency services in Hamas-run Gaza. We are starting to learn new details of Israel's preliminary investigation into that strike. The IDF says they dropped two precise bombs on a structure where senior Hamas leaders were meeting, but that the explosion caused something else to ignite in a neighboring structure. That caused that firestorm, which just ripped through the camp. People sleeping in tents made of wood and of plastic, those tents going up in just a matter of seconds. Now, the White House calling those images heartbreaking, saying Israel has the right to pursue Hamas, but that it must protect civilians. We're also learning that the U.S. military has been forced to suspend delivery of aid into Gaza by sea after its temporary pier was damaged in heavy seas. That's according to a U.S. official, a U.N. official, and an Israeli official. The U.N. official tells us it could be up to a week before that temporary pier system is repaired, before aid can be flowing in again. And this is just the latest setback for the American aid operation. A U.S. service member is in critical condition in hospital here in Israel after suffering a non-combat injury on the pier last week. Back to you. Ross Sanchez, thank you so much for that reporting. Let me now bring in Monica Alba at the White House. Monica, on the one hand, the White House said a major operation would be a red line, but they're also not condemning this latest strike. So how is the administration justifying that position on Rafa? Yeah, Yamish, they're saying essentially that this was a horrible incident, that, of course, the U.S., is sympathetic to the just really disturbing images that have come out of Rafa, but they are saying that when the president has talked about what would change U.S. policy here in Gaza, it would have amounted to a complete ground offensive in Rafa. And the U.S. says, according to multiple U.S. officials and in the briefing today, that they have not seen evidence of that. And because this was an airstrike that, as you saw Raf talk about there, then it led to igniting those fuel tanks that led to the deadly fires, that that does not constitute what the Biden administration has been calling smashing into Rafa. And now the U.S. still says that they don't assess that those tanks have at least entered the heart of Rafa and the population centers that, again, the president himself has warned about being a potential red line. But they said that they were also taking the Israeli word for that and that they still wanted to get more information about exactly where the movement had been, but also we know for some weeks now that the U.S. has assessed that there has been enough troop buildup from Israel's side that they could go forward with a larger movement or offensive if they decided to do that. Yeah. Yamish. Yeah, well, a lot to consider there. And I wonder, is President Biden concerned about what kind of political pressure this puts on him both from voters and progressive lawmakers, Democrats, within his own party? Yeah, and remember that it was after those seven World Central Kitchen aid workers were killed in an Israeli airstrike in early April that the president conveyed to Prime Minister Netanyahu that it was possible that the U.S. would condition support to Israel if it didn't see any changes to how certain aid workers and civilians would be better protected. And there were all these questions about how that could go forward. And now in the wake of this deadly incident, again, the U.S. is saying that they want to wait for Israel to do its own initial investigation. But you are already seeing some progressive lawmakers, as you said, and others really add to this political pressure, as well as what we're seeing from the international community that is really roundly condemning this and wants the U.S. to say and do more about it. Yamish. Yeah, certainly a situation we'll keep watching. Thank you so much, Monica Alba at the White House. After the break, new developments from the Manhattan courthouse where the prosecution is delivering closing arguments in Trump's criminal hush money trial. Don't go anywhere. You're watching Meet the Press now.
Welcome back. Let's turn back to the very latest from the courthouse in lower Manhattan. The district attorney's office is getting ready to wrap up its closing arguments in former President Trump's hush money trial. Joining me now is NBC News' Dasha Burns. So, Dasha, cast us up on the latest here. Where is the prosecution as it's continuing its closing arguments? So, Gimish, I was just inside the courtroom in the overflow room listening to Joshua Steinglass present those closing arguments. He is really going into minute detail, going over text messages, going over emails, phone logs, making sure that the jury remembers that everything that they heard from these witnesses is corroborated, or most of it is corroborated by documentary evidence. Right now, he was just going over the critical Access Hollywood tape. The reason he reminds jurors that this is important is it sets up the stakes for the Trump campaign, the mindset for uh, Trump, the RNC and his team at the time that the Access Hollywood tape was leaked. And that's the time when they were starting to deal with Stormy Daniels and her story, raising the stakes to make sure uh, that that story did not get out before the election. So he's going over uh, all, all of that and making sure that the jury understands exactly where the campaign was at. He hasn't fully gotten into the Stormy Daniels story yet. He's about a third of the way through his arguments, which means we still have several hours to go here. I mean, as, you're, as you talk through the fact that we have several hour, several more hours to go here, I wonder if you could say anything about NBC News reporting, because we're, we're all looking at this Google Doc and all looking at all of these different reports from the, where people can see the jury. How is this playing as this has gone on and on and on? Well, according to some of our colleagues in the courtroom, the jury is getting maybe a little bit sleepy. One juror looking up at the ceiling, sort of craning her neck. It's been a very long day, and it's possible it's going to extend later into this evening. There were a couple of moments where things were getting pretty animated. At one point, Steinglass was trying to uh, refute the defense's argument that that one phone call that Michael Cohen made in October to Trump's body man, Keith Schiller, that was about 90-some seconds. The defense says he didn't have time in that in that phone call to talk to Schiller about his own personal issue with some kid harassing him and to talk to the former president. Well, Steinglass did a little bit of a performance. He had a sort of fake phone call where he very slowly, not in a rushed fashion, addressed as though he were Michael Cohen, Keith Schiller saying, hey, this kid is harassing me. Oh, by the way, can I talk to the boss? He basically recounted what, what a conversation could be that included uh, a conversation with the former president that lasted 49 seconds. So some theater engaging jurors, uh, but a lot of minute detail right now, Yavish. Yeah, well, Dasha, thank you so much um, for all your reporting. And with all the attention now on Trump's New York trial, we have a new development in the special counsel's case against the former president for mishandling classified documents. The judge in that case, Eileen Cannon, has initially denied the special counsel's request to gag Trump for making statements that could potentially endanger law enforcement. That comes as Trump and his allies have spread false claims and wild conspiracy theories that the FBI's search of Mar-a-Lago was part of an assassination plot. Joining me now is NBC News Justice and Intelligence Correspondent Ken Delaney. And so, Ken, thanks for being here. Tell us more about this decision from Judge Cannon. What reason did she give for denying the special counsel's request to have a gag order put in place? It all hinges on legal technicalities, Yamish. Judge Cannon ruled that the special counsel didn't give Trump's lawyers enough notice and didn't comply with a rule requiring, requiring so-called meaningful conferral with the other side when filing a motion. And she appeared to agree with Trump's lawyers that the special counsel should not have filed this motion on Friday before the holiday weekend without talking to them. And she said doing so reflected a lack of professional courtesy. And she even warned the special counsel's office that if they do something like this again, they might face sanctions. Now, Jack Smith's office argued that it tried to reach out to Trump's legal team, but they refused to discuss the matter in detail until Monday. And they said that since Mr. Trump's false statements about the FBI's use of force documents were posing a risk to law enforcement officers, they needed to move forward quickly. Not only did Judge Cannon seem to reject that, she made no mention of the underlying issue, the fact that Donald Trump has continued to lie about a routine document and suggest that President Biden authorized the FBI to assassinate him when it searched his home for classified documents. As you know, Yamish, the FBI timed its search to take place when Trump was not there, and the document in question simply stated that FBI agents have a right to defend themselves when threatened. That same document, by the way, was included 
in the paperwork when the FBI searched President Biden's home looking for classified documents, Yamiche. Well, now that this order is in place, and does this a special counsel have any recourse if former President Trump continues to share this use of force conspiracy? The judge dismissed the motion without prejudice, and that means they can refile it. She also dismissed a motion by the defense asking her to punish the special counsel. So look, the, the, the special counsel can absolutely refile this motion, but the question is whether that office will decide it's worth doing given Cannon's ruling, whether they have a chance of winning. It was pretty telling that Judge Cannon seemed more worried about legal technicalities than whether a criminal defendant in her courtroom is acting in a way that puts law enforcement officers at risk. Yamish. Ken Delaney, and thank you so much for breaking all that down. In the other trial, we should say in the other case, because there's no trial yet, but in the other case. Still to come, the very latest out of Ohio, where lawmakers have convened a special session amid a partisan fight over getting President Biden on the general election ballot in November. We're live in Columbus with the very latest. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back. President Biden clinched the Democratic presidential nomination months ago. But as of right now, his name isn't on the ballot in Ohio. That's because his nomination isn't officially official until delegates meet at the Democratic National Convention. But the convention isn't scheduled until after Ohio's deadline to get on the ballot. Today, Ohio lawmakers are convening in Columbus after Republican Governor Mike DeWine called for a rare special session to attempt to resolve the issue. To be sure, this situation isn't unprecedented. In 2012, then President Barack Obama and presidential candidate Mitt Romney faced similar challenges in Ohio until the legislature stepped in and passed a procedural fix. But this time around, the simple fix is being held up by partisan politics. And we just learned that Democrats are not waiting around for the state to take action. Today, the DNC announced it will virtually nominate President Biden ahead of the convention to avoid missing Ohio's ballot deadline. Joining me now from Columbus, Ohio, is NBC News senior national political reporter Henry Gomez. So what more do we know, Henry, about the backup plan that the DNC appears to be moving forward with? And how are they reacting to what's happening in Ohio? Well, Yamish, what, what happened here is the DNC and the Biden campaign, they took a look at this Republican-dominated legislature in Ohio, and they realized they couldn't expect any favors from them, or let alone favors, they couldn't expect them to simply do what they've done in the past, and that's put President Biden on the ballot since he's going to be his party's nominee. So they, as you mentioned, they're going to have a virtual roll call beginning next week. We'll start to see a resolution go out that will ask and propose to change the rules, allow Biden to be virtually nominated. And then once that's approved by a full DNC membership, we'll move to a virtual roll call, which may you may remember this process taking place back in 2020 in the middle of a pandemic when they had a virtual convention program every night. But this is being done rarely and early because the Republicans weren't going to play ball. So it, it really has been a stalemate here. You mentioned po partisan politics at play, and that's absolutely what's gummed up the works here. And now we're just waiting to see if the DNC process can uh, carry out and if it stands here with uh, the Republican officials in Ohio. And this is such an interesting uh, situation. You talk about the fact that the Republicans weren't willing to play ball. So are the Republicans off the hook now? And what were they asking for in exchange for putting President Biden's name on the ballot? Well, Governor Mike DeWine, who called this special session that we're at this week, he has said in a statement that was just put out about an hour or two ago that the Republicans and the legislature aren't off the hook. He still expects to see legislation from them by the end of the week on his desk. And DeWine and the Republicans want two things out of this special session. They do want the provision that will uh, ease the deadline for Biden and put him on the ballot, but they also want legislation that would ban foreign money and state ballot initiative campaigns, as well as some other procedural campaign finance moves that Democrats feel are very onerous to citizen-led initiatives and ballot campaigns. This is what the Republicans say they needed in exchange for doing this favor for Biden. Uh, Senate Republican President Matt Huffman talked about how his members didn't want to go back to their districts and explain that they uh, basically created the environment for Biden to get on the ballot without having something tangible in return. So that's really what's been at play. Deep partisan politics at its root. And Democrats have said that these uh, provisions that are being added 
monitor poison pills that they're not necessary, that federal law already bans foreign money in these state campaigns that we're talking about, and that this is only being done to exact some sort of price for something that's been done by both parties uh, without rancor or without really uh, any sort of uh, special attention or note over the last uh, few years that it's happened. Well, certainly an interesting situation, especially as you have a Republican governor for forcing essentially a Republican-led legislature to, to, to do their job. So thank you so much, Henry, for your reporting. Thank you. And we're back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. The news continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.